so I think what you had today, uh, you had a full house. As of last week, we were turning off, turning away people. So I've just spoken to Siok Kri. We're going to have this as an annual debate. Annual debate, Siap Siap debate. Uh, we'll use different topics. But I think what you saw was a very engaging contest of wits, of ideas. And I think in, in the audience, you can form a view as to where, which side of the fence you're on. And so I thought it was a great platform for people to air ideas and for us to enlighten the arbitration committee. Basically, the motion has two questions built into it. The first question is, may a court outside the arbitral seat recognize an award that has been annulled? And the second question is, should a court, and should a court often outside the arbitral seat, recognize an annulled award? On the first question, there's really no question at all. On the first question, the New York Convention is explicit in Article 5.1 that non-recognition of an award is permissive, optional, not mandatory. Article 5.1 uses the word may and it uses it deliberately, as does Article 6. Building on that, Article 7 of the New York Convention also provides that nothing in the Convention prevents a contracting party, a contracting state to the Convention from recognizing an award under its local law, even if the convention would allow non-recognition. You put those two provisions together, Article 5, 1, and Article 7, and it's absolutely clear that a court may recognize an annulled award, an award annulled in the arbitral seat. So really, the only question is, should a court outside the arbitral seat often recognize awards that have been annulled in the arbitral seat. And to that, I think the answer also is clear. Unfortunately, courts in a number of jurisdictions have annulled awards on grounds that are entirely inconsistent with both basic principles of international law, denial of justice, due process, fair procedures, and that are entirely inconsistent with the New York Convention. And in those circumstances, no court, particularly no court in a state that is party to the New York Convention, should deny recognition to an award because it's been annulled in the arbitral seat. Classic example is the Termo Rio case in the United States, where a Colombian court set aside, annulled an award made in Colombia on the basis that an agreement to arbitrate under ICC rules was invalid, per se invalid. That was not a valid ground for annulment under Article 2 of the New York Convention, and it's not an annulment that should play any role in decisions whether or not to recognize an award outside the arbitral seat. Equally, decisions by courts in particular jurisdictions, for example, that, that an arbitral award is, is capable of annulment because the arbitrators were of a particular religion or a particular gender, are no basis at all for annulment, for recognition outside the arbitral seat. At the end of the day, it's only the grounds in Article 5.1a, b, c, and d which ought to provide grounds for non-recognition outside the arbitral seat. Thank you. Toby Landau and I were opposing the motion. The motion is that international arbitration awards that have been uh, annulled or set aside in the country where that arbitration tribunal sat, in the territory, say, of Singapore, the Singapore courts and only the Singapore courts get to decide whether to set aside that award. Lots of other courts can decide whether to enforce it later on if it hasn't been set aside, but they can never, foreign court can never actually set aside the award. So the question that's come up in some very famous cases that grab headlines is whether once, say, the Singapore court has set aside an award for some reason, whether the winner, who's, first he was the winner and then turns out he's the loser because it's set aside, can go to the U.S. or the U.K. or somewhere where their assets and nonetheless have a live award that justifies 
uh, it's getting paid. And our, mo our, our position was, yes, of course that can happen with the in the most egregious situations where the, the award was set aside, for example, by bribery or corruption or a totally idiotic decision or a violation of natural justice. But those are very, very rare. Therefore, the default, the normal, is that an award that gets set aside should be dead and should not be resurrected in other courts later on. That's an abuse of their power to do so. And it, un it upsets the international system, which calls for finality after that setting aside. So really, the other, the other team agreed with us as well that the exceptions are so rare that it shouldn't often happen. But we had a lot of fun disagreements on theory about whether there should be um, international law that's free-floating with uniform standards all around the world. Our position was that's an impossible dream, and we have to live with the international legal system that we have, which is the New York Convention as a treaty uh, and the uh, slowly evolving common positions of the court. My part of the uh, argument was to focus on the text and the scheme of the New York Convention itself. And uh, the proposition being, my proposition being, that the uh, argument is completely answered once and for all by the New York Convention itself. Because the New York Convention, when it was drafted, embodied a territorial conception of arbitration, which is a link to the legal seat. Uh, and that means that awards are not free floating uh, around the firmament that they can, if they've been set aside, they can still somehow be enforced in other countries. Rather, the New York Convention reflects a particular link in many, many different respects between arbitration, the arbitration agreement, the arbitration procedure, and an award to the legal seat. Uh, and that means when you choose a legal seat, you are buying into a system uh, of law and a court, uh, and that court has the ability to set aside uh, awards. And so that was the, the main thrust of the argument. And to say that uh, an award that's been set aside can still be enforced is cutting right across that scheme, which you find in Articles 5 and 6 of the New York Convention. Uh, and the, the way the other side did it uh, was mischievous by focusing upon a few isolated words out of context without applying the Vienna Convention on the law of treaties. Um, and ultimately, it is a, uh, it's a curious result because you know, one wants to take the advantage of uh, a legal seat in many respects, in getting assistance, in constituting a tribunal, getting interim measures, uh, getting any other help locally. And yet, when the local court steps in and does something that you don't want, like setting aside the award, the other side say you walk away from that and you can cherry pick. And that's uh, self-evidently wrong. Well, the conclusion, look, I'm biased, you know. <laughs> I, I, you know, espouse the opposition side. So as moderator, it was important that I stayed in the middle, but I think in terms of the conclusion, you could see from the vote that the majority of the House, after hearing both proponents, were of the view that the opposition should carry the day. Um, but that's not to say, you know, one is right and one is wrong. It's, it's at the end of the day, a judgment call. Which side of the coin should you fall in? And, you know, you've, you've heard from the House, the opposition carried the day today.